Men, today we have found a white monk, a member of an order that stretches back over 900 years. Stay with us as this man from an old order helps us focus our lives, connect with individuals who've lost their faith or have no faith, and offers proof of the benefit of living a virtuous life. Welcome to another episode of the Catholic Gentleman Podcast. Today we are joined by Father John Bayer, or I'm sorry, Bayer, um, a monk at Our Lady of Dallas Station Abbey, and we'll introduce Father John in a little more detail in just a moment. But first, uh, if you enjoy this podcast and you've benefited from it in any way, please prayerfully consider supporting us on Patreon. Uh, at patreon.com slash Catholic gentlemen. We have a lot of different tiers available with some, some great re some great rewards or benefits, whatever you want to call them. And uh, uh, please consider, you know, five, $10, anything helps uh, us continue this work and even expand it further. Uh, so uh, again, let's uh, we're joined by father John Byer today. Um, he is a monk at Our Lady of Dallas, Cistercian Abbey, and a teacher at Cistercian Preparatory School in Irving, Texas. Currently, he is the form master for the class of 2025 and teaches English, grammar, Latin, philosophy, and theology. Uh, Father Beyer is also an adjunct professor of theology at the University of Dallas, and his courses there have been focused on theology, apologetics, and the relationship between faith and science. Thanks so much for being with us, Father. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, Father, uh, we well, want to. I'll oh, go for it, Sam. No, no, go, 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 go. Ahead. Yeah, yeah. We want to. <laughs> we want to uh, dive right into the life of a Cistercian, and we want to, in particular, your life, Father Bayer, and how. Um, you know, how did the Cistercian order come to existence, right? I think um, those of us uh, outside saw, you know, the Benedictines uh, becoming a little soft and the Cistercians coming in and being like, you know, we're going to go back to the, the original <laughs> rule. Uh, so, you know, to shed, shed or uh, stamp out our ignorance and let us know a little bit about the Cistercians. No, that's basically it. We're awesome. Everybody else isn't. You got it. <laughs> no, so in uh, the 11th and 12th century, there's a lot of very fertile rediscovery of ancient sources. And of course, a lot of this leads to the rise of scholasticism and the recovery of lots of texts and translations that uh, for at least a couple of centuries weren't well known in the West. But part of that resourcement and that return to uh, the sources of scripture and the rule of St. Benedict and the church fathers led to a re-examination of monastic life. Um, the Benedictine life at that time had been very intimately tied with the feudal structure, the kind of Carolingian Renaissance that had preceded this 11th, 12th century renewal had, had wedded those two institutions, namely the, the feudal system and the monastic system pretty closely. And the uh, different compromises that emerged through that alliance um, you know, for example, the ability to accrue a lot of wealth such that the monks would no longer have to work and they could mm -hmm. spend a lot more time in prayer. Or again, the, the accumulation of wealth leading to uh, a different way of, of living poverty. Um, and the original uh, pioneers of what became the Cistercian Order wanted to return to what they felt was a more uh, pure and simple observance of the rule of St. Benedict. And so they wanted to reemphasize the importance of the monks actually working for their daily bread. Uh, they wanted to simplify uh, the amount of prayer they would do. So the Cluniac tradition, which was one of the big mm. Benedictine traditions of the Carolingian time, had uh, instituted what I think scholars call the Laus Perennis, or the perennial praise. And they would pray for like eight hours a day three shifts a day. Mm. Um, and the Cistercians, one of the things they did was to simplify the liturgy and to actually reduce the amount of time you spent in church in order to be able to do other things that belong to the monastic tradition, like work. Yeah. Uh, there was also an aesthetic uh, sensitivity that the first Cistercians had. So St. Bernard in particular wanted to simplify 
the art and architecture of um, this new monasticism. And I think that uh, one of the important things to say is, is that uh, this, um, I guess you could say reexamination was something that went well for the most part. And, you know, inevitably, we also kind of didn't live up to our ideals. And uh, one of the neat books that I've read about Cistercian history, not that I'm any kind of expert, but uh, this book happened to be written by a confrere of mine, Father Louis Lacai. It's mm. called Cistercians, Ideals and Realities. So, you know, you, he enunciate or he, he gives us the, the founding ideals that led to the reform and then kind of traces the history of the order thereafter and shows that, you know, just like all of us were pilgrims and were aspiring to something far greater than we in, in one lifetime and in one particular observance can embody. Uh, and so, you know, this, when, when I tell the story, I try to make sure to do it humbly because you know anybody yeah. could look at our own life and certainly find ways in which we fall short of the fullness of the monastic tradition and ways in which the Benedictines are, are exemplary and, and edify us all. Um, so anyway, that's a, a brief uh, awesome. introduction to the way in which we're reform order. Yeah. And for our listeners where you guys have St. Bernard of Clairvaux, and I know he wasn't an original founder, but he was, you know, early expansion and things like that. And so such great, um, great saints within your order. And there's, there's a lot more than that. So I appreciate you sharing a little bit about the history there. Yeah, just real quick. I, we've had, just so you know, you have some competition. We've had a Dominican on the podcast recently, a Franciscan, and now we have a Benedictine slash Cistercian. It's kind of something like the beginning of a bad joke, like a Benedictine, a Franciscan, and a Dominican walk into a bar. But, uh, but really, it's 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 an interesting uh, mix, just these different orders and these different charisms in the church. And, you know, Dominicans are kind of like preaching and studying things like that. The Franciscans serving the poor and and living that evangelical poverty. But if you just, if you could like really boil it down for us, like what, what makes the Benedictine tradition unique as opposed to some of these like um, mendicant orders and things like that, that um, uh, travel around a lot more and things like that. Yeah. Good question. So one thing uh, that I like to say is that the different religious orders or, you know, that's a very healthy pluralism in the church. So Christ has all kinds of vocations in his toolkit that he can deploy at different ages of, of church history. Um, and then another thing I like to point out about the history of religious orders is that the concept of a religious order, where you have a very specific, we say now, charism that is supposed to mark you off from another religious order, this is something that only emerges within the last five to 700 years. Uh, the, the, in fact, the advent of the Cistercian order is in some ways, at least legislatively, the first time you have this concept of a religious order. You know, monasteries bound together with a very specific way of life uh, and also a governmental structure that binds them together. In the first millennium, and I think you guys know a fair amount about the Eastern Church, so this will be very mm -hmm. familiar, that the concept of religious order isn't, isn't the same at all, if it's even there. You just have different monasteries. Mm -hmm. And when you right. join the religious life, you go and join a specific community. You don't become a part of some global institutional structure. And so I think that in order to understand monasticism, we have to kind of peel back our understanding historically of what a religious order is. And most fundamentally to try to define the charism of uh, monasticism, I think you, you have to point to the search for God. So St. Benedict in the rule when he's speaking about the novice master and how he should help the, the monk discern whether or not he's called there, he says like, you know, above all, he should be sure whether the monk truly seeks God. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a question of like, am I going to be a good teacher or am I really good at, you know, carpentry or do I like Latin or not? Or am I able to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning? Like all those things are really secondary. You know, God can accomplish in us what to us seems impossible. The only thing that matters is if he is in fact calling you here and you are in fact seeking him. If that's the case, well, then all this other stuff, you know, will work itself out in his good time. Mm. Um, so I think that that's really the essence of monastic life, the search for God. I think mm. Pope Benedict in a, uh, an address he gave at Paris in 2007, I believe, 
um, expressed that very beautifully and sort of traced how everything else in monastic culture from its, you know, its love for the written word and therefore education and uh, the different disciplines and to music to a manual labor and community life, how all this sort of unfolds out of the search for God. So I like that way of defining the quote unquote charism. But on the other hand, there is something that now in modern times where we do have more specific things to distinguish us from other religious orders, it can be kind of unhelpful because I'm not going to tell Dominican that, okay, what we do is search for God. I don't know what you guys do. (laughs) So like there is something obviously common to the religious vocation as such uh, that the search for God names. But historically, concretely, if we look at our sources, you know, it wasn't the case that the Benedictine said, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to be a teaching order or we're going to be an order that focuses on manual labor. Like those are those are all secondary features that emerge, I think, only later when we're trying now to articulate what makes us different than the others. And there's something dangerous to that if we try to focus so specifically on these secondary things in order to distinguish ourselves from other religious orders, because then we can very easily lose sight of the real driving principle of the religious life, which is the search for God that binds us in common. Yeah, I love that. I love that emphasis on search for God. Um, And we see that search that single-minded search, I think, um, you know, St. Paul talks about people who are married in the world. And of course we have our own path to sanctification, but, but we're always going to be kind of distracted by just the practicalities of caring for kids, education, putting food on the table or jobs, things like that, that are very, um, distracting i guess that's the best way um and it makes that search for god even though that's the call of every christian um a little more difficult but the 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 god has always called out those including yourself who say this is this is going to be my job is finding god (laughs) um Mm -hmm. and 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 um that is the monastic life in, in essence so i love that simplicity and just kind of cutting through all the different maybe external manifestations of that and really getting to the heart of it yeah, in my own life, uh, there was a moment where I sensed the the sweetness of that simplicity. I remember my first retreat at the monastery was accidental. I didn't know it was a vocations retreat. I thought it was just like a retreat retreat. Uh, it wasn't, nobody deceived me or anything. It was just my own naivete and not understanding how these things work. But um, it is kind of a funny story, actually, so I'll tell that. So like, yeah, I went please. to college at the University of Dallas, had an absolutely wonderful time. And if we get into my vocation story, I'll have plenty of things to say about that. But I knew some um, some upperclassmen, some guys who were seniors when I was a junior. And uh, some of these guys, now Father Thomas and Father Ambrose, joined the monastery. Um, I was friends with them. They joined. And that was the first time that would really entered into my imagination that, holy smokes, you know, people can do this. And when I became a senior, um, I was thinking about law school, getting ready for the LSAT, all that kind of stuff. And around Easter time of my spring semester senior year, I was finishing thesis, doing LSAT prep and everything. And so just kind of really feeling um, tired and exhausted. And uh, I got to a class, Shakespeare with Dr. Wegemer, and I was there a few minutes early and there was a friend of mine named Aaron there. And I said, Aaron, what are you doing? Uh, you know, this Easter, just kind of like plopping down and, you know, you talk to me, I'm exhausted. (laughs) And he says, well, I'm going on retreat. And immediately I said, gosh, retreat, there's nothing I'd like to do more than go on retreat during, during the triduum now. And I said, where are you going? Wanting immediately to jump on. And he said, oh, I'm going to the monastery. And I said, they do retreats, the monastery right across the street from UD. And I said, well, I know Father Thomas. So let me shoot him an email. Then brother Thomas, he was a novice. Hmm. And I shot him an email and his reply back says, well, I'm not sure. I'll have to ask. And I'm thinking, what? I, I'm signing up for a retreat. What do you, what do you have to is you tell me? I mean, how much do I pay? Is that it? Or, yeah. No. And so he had to go. the reason he had to go vet was because it's a vocations retreat. And I was not on their radar at all as a, as a, oh, wow. as a candidate. I, I was in a very serious relationship with an awesome girl. I had clear plans about what I would do after school. So anyway, uh, he did eventually reply to the email saying he'd spoken to the abbot and he had vetted me that I could come on the retreat. And I was there and all this is just to tell this, this point about my discovery of the simplicity of the search for God. And I remember being at dinner one day on the retreat and 
uh, I w- I had kind of accepted, you know, okay, this is vocations retreat. I'll be open. I'll think about it. And they were reading from the rule of St. Benedict and the chapter on the reception of guests. And the, 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 the lines were about how you should uh, welcome the guest as Christ. And, you know, the abbot breaks his fast in order to be with the guests. And I just remember being struck by asking myself, what if the only thing anyone ever asked of me was just to see Christ in other people? Like, what if that was my only responsibility? Uh, how beautiful would life be? And so the singularity, the simplicity of of the Christian life at that point became really appealing. Um, so anyway, just to confirm your your observation of the the simplicity and the of that search for God and how attractive it is. Yeah, I love how God was seeking you out in those moments, right? How how the living God is really. Um, uh, working behind the scenes in ways that, that we don't, uh, you know, fully understand. And I, I think of my own, uh, life and in, in vocational discernment into marriage. I was on, you know, multiple different priest lists and I, of all places was playing trumpet in the 2008 Beijing Olympics. And I met a violinist over there who was a viol- you know, a violinist and a Catholic and come to find out that his, his sister lived in Dallas. I was moving back to Dallas and he introduced me to her and she's now my wife and, you know, best thing in my life. And, and, uh, you know, so, uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating how God really brings out those knowings in in those moments. So I do want to hear though, more about your life uh, day to day, maybe, maybe even more about your vocation story and why the Cistercians and why not diocesan priesthood. I know, um, that, and there's the Dominicans there at, at university of Dallas, right? So there's, there was a lot of opportunities to experience um, various orders. Uh, what was it that really called you and, and touched your heart in that way uh, with the Cistercians? Yeah. Okay. So let me back up a bit then and just kind yeah. of start from the beginning. Uh, I grew up in a Catholic home. Um, so you can say I was a cradle Catholic. My father taught theology at Fordham for a couple of years. And uh, I remember that he was instrumental in awakening in me a uh, sensitivity to religious questions. So he was, I love my dad, but he's got some fun quirks. And yeah. just a, one story about that is he would, one time he called all three of the kids into his room. And I don't know, we were maybe six, seven and nine or something. My, yeah. my brother is younger than I am. My sister's older and I'm in the middle. And he says, okay, children, like I have something to tell you. Uh, but before I tell you, I want you to know that it doesn't change anything. I will still pay for your food and for your school. But the truth is I'm a robot and I can't love you. <laughs> and we were like, what? Like, no, this, he's just playing. He said, okay, I'll show you my number. So he takes off his shoe and sock and he shows us this number that he had written on his big toe with a Sharpie. And at that point huh. we lost it. And of course, he consoles us later and he tells us, you know, he's just messing around. But it was such a profound insight that it matters whether my dad is a robot or not, whether he's Mm. free or not, whether he's a person or not. This life is not just about a warm bed, a warm meal and getting, you know, an education so that I can do what I want in life. The love of my father matters to me. And I love him back and I don't want him to be just a machine. So uh, that was one way uh, he awakened, um, you know, really important questions. Another is like, I remember being in the car and he would just turn back and say, you know, kids, what's the nature of love? Like, what does it mean to love someone? And we just kind of, not that we found all the great answers, but we, we teased out some thoughts and saw how they fell short. And then he gave us Aquinas's, you know, to love is to intend the good of the other. Yeah. And uh, so we were from a very young age chewing on some really deep stuff. And that, that really impressed me. Um, I think my mom was also a very important part, obviously, in my growing up and also shaping me into somebody who could discern and accept the call from God to this kind of life. I remember, for example, my mom singing to me and my siblings and showing us a lot of classical music. And I think that uh, the songs she would sing and the music she showed made a big impact on my, maybe my, I don't know, my sensitivity or um, just my 
enjoyment of, of simple things, tender things. Uh, she sang a lot in German because she was born and raised in Germany. And some of those songs maybe reminded her of her homeland. And so there was maybe a bit of nostalgia that I think I might have picked up through the emotion in her singing. But I, I remember that very fondly. And I think that's probably uh, shaped me in, in deeper ways. I think also my mom, uh, particularly through one project I remember when I was very young, shaped in me a love for, for nature that has definitely shaped my spirituality. Um, I remember when I must've been like five or six, something like that. And we were living in California and she was a teacher at the time. And one of the things that she did with us at home was something I think she did with her students at school, namely uh, like grow silkworms. And uh, so we had in the basement of our house, these shoe boxes with egg cartons inside and then lots and lots of silkworms. And I just remember going through this project with my mom day after day, kind of checking in on the silkworms when they hatched and what they were doing and eating, how much of the leaves they had eaten. And I remember being fascinated by the edges to the leaves that the silkworms would uh, carve out by, by what they would eat. And I uh, just remember loving uh, all things kind of natural and beautiful. And uh, I wouldn't have articulated it this way at the time, but I think I was acquiring a love for the world as God presents it to us and just being fascinated by the mystery of nature and uh, preferring that to um, kind of the artificial world where we recreate reality in our own image and try to impose our ideas upon it, but instead being grateful and willing to marvel at the world that God's created, respect it, and try to live in accord with it. And I think that that sensibility has definitely shaped my um, my attitude towards creation and therefore also the creator and my effort at least to be docile to, to him and not try to steer my own way through things. Uh, and certainly that's something that stays with me when I backpack or when I pray in the woods or something like that. So I think that would be definitely a gift I got from my mom. I think another um, big influence from my life was, um, you know, sadly, my parents divorced and there was a lot of suffering in my family um, through that. And um, that's that's very sad. And, you know, I think anybody who has familiarity with divorce knows how that can affect people. But God in his goodness, I think, brought a lot of gifts out of that for me. So it was hard to see my parents and my family fall apart. But at the same time, that um, very close exposure to really intense suffering and just the messiness of human life can really waken you up uh, to what's important and to disabuse you of a lot of the superficiality that we can be tempted to fall into in our age of distraction. So a readiness uh, to wrestle with the difficult aspects of human life, um, that was, a, I think, a really important gift I received. Uh, growing up, I didn't know anything about religious orders. So we were, again, a cradle Catholic family, but I think that a lot of Catholic culture for some time now, and I'm not a historian well enough to know how long and what the causes are, but a lot of Catholic culture doesn't seem interested in these kinds of topics, vocations, mm -hmm. religious mm -hmm. life. And so even though I was a cradle Catholic, we went to mass every Sunday. My father was a theologian. I didn't know anything about monks and nuns, except what I learned from like Whoopi Goldberg and Sister Act. You know, <laughs> that, okay, there are these people wearing robes who do funny things. Yeah. Um, but honestly, I didn't know anything about it. Going to high school and then my first year of college, um, if you had said the word monk to me, I would have thought like, you know, B Tibet or Buddhism or something like that. Um, uh, okay, going to college now, I, I think my high school experience and my first year of college, which was at Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts, was um, setting me up to kind of go along with the, you know, the course of the river of my millennial generation, I guess. Yeah, I was um, in, you know, in fortunate ways, I was pretty selfish, I think, uh, very focused on just sort of what I want, what's easiest, what's most pleasurable, what makes me look good. And so I think I was I was heading down a bad path there. Um, and God and his providence really rescued me, I believe, because as a remote consequence of my parents' divorce, after my first year of college, 
I lost all my financial aid uh, at Holy Cross. So my family was not very wealthy. Um, and I was only able to go to Holy Cross with a lot of financial aid. And just a month before my sophomore year was starting, it all vanished. And there was nothing I could do to appeal to the university. You know, please don't take my parents' stuff out on me. Like, you know, I don't know what happened, who made what phone call, what its effect was, but I just want to go back to school again, be with my friends and keep living the life I was living. But for whatever reason, um, they didn't do it. And so I had just before my sophomore year to find a new school. Mm. And uh, I had initially applied to the University of Dallas and other schools when I was first going to college. Um, and I applied there mostly because my father wanted me to apply there because he had gone there for a master's. And we had a lot of family in the DFW area of Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth. And um, so I had applied there initially, but I didn't want to go there. Uh, I had the impression that it's a school for dorks and mm -hmm. I want to have fun and I don't want to go there. So uh, I was very negative uh, toward UD. Uh, however, now I need to go to school and the only school that responded quickly enough to allow me to go to college at all my sophomore year uh, was UD. And so I went wow. down there kind of sullen, um, but within, I'd say, two weeks of being at UD, I saw by the, the people who were there and the classes I was taking that, okay, it's time to close the mouth and open the ears because there's a very different way of living life here. And there's a, an intellectual and spiritual seriousness here that I was humbled by pretty, pretty soon after arriving there. And I met people who, who were just so interesting uh, because of their background and their studies and the fact that they were actually diving deeply and in a way that was attractive into books like Dostoevsky or Shakespeare or Plato or whatever. And I was like, wow, like all those cool names that people like to throw out at cocktail parties, like they're, right. they're worth reading and enriching for, for your life. Uh, and so I basically started sitting down and opening my ears to the best I could. Um, and that launched a tremendous conversion. Uh, UD was one of the, the, the biggest uh, blessings of my life because of the way it takes human life seriously and um, plugs you into the resources to, to know the nature of reality and, and how, how to live in light of it, as one of my literature professors, Dr. Roper, put it. Um, UD also has this great Rome program. So I went on the Rome program for a semester and that was another jump in my spiritual life. Still not thinking so much about a vocation, but just really loving being a Catholic. Um, I remember, you know, lots of wonderful things in my Rome semester, but one in particular that struck me deeply was being at an audience for uh, Pope St. John Paul II. And it was strange how when he passed by in the Pope mobile, I, I just was overcome with enthusiasm in a way that I had never been before. And like, I never thought of myself as like a Pope groupie or whatever. I yeah. like, okay, he's the Pope, right? Okay, that's neat. But then like somehow his person, uh, the experience of the moment, being there with other Catholics, there was a newness and enthusiasm that, that I had there that, that it, I didn't sense from myself. Um, so... Okay, long story short, um, Rome's great. I come back. I'm super excited to study. I end up becoming a philosophy major because I couldn't cut it in the UD math department. So I thought I was good at math and I was at least as anybody had tried to teach me math in high school in my first year of college. Like mm. I could do calculus at least as I had been taught it, which I think was basically plug and chug. Yeah. But when I got into real math classes at UD because I entered as a math major, I was initially drama back at Holy Cross, but then I think entered UD as math. I, I would go through whole classes and there were no numbers on the board. There were just letters and symbols. And I was like, okay, I thought math had to do with numbers. Like I'm way out of my league here. <laughs> and so um, within a couple of weeks of, of that, I was like, I need to find a new major or my GPA is just gonna be really bad. Uh -huh. And uh, I eventually landed on philosophy. And that was another one of the tremendous gifts of providence in my life, because I just loved philosophy, especially at UD. Um, it gave me, I believe, uh, a, a tremendous ability to read. Um, I didn't really, you know, I don't think, or at least I can't measure it, grow so much as a writer that came later in my life. 
Um, but having to read difficult texts mm. and uh, I certainly had plenty of help to grow as a writer, but I, I don't know that I really made all the jumps that uh, that I made subsequently. But the uh, the gift of being forced to really cut your teeth on some hard texts and then more significantly for at least my vocation story, uh, a palpable sense for the reality of God, um, just asking the question of God's existence and doing it in a way that's like, holy smokes, like, I really do think that God exists. And I'm not sure how to account for anything, let alone my own mind and its rational faculty, apart from the reality of God. And it's a really neat moment when you when you get, get there, because then it's like everything you touch out there, it's like, holy smokes, God is, you know, yeah. shining through this as well. Absolutely. So that was powerful. And then I think probably the 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 next biggest influence to mention in my vocation story is this wonderful girl that I dated for um, two and a half years or so. Um, she was from Texas, a Southern belle. Uh, and I learned a lot from her in so many ways. Um, her family too was, was wonderful. Um, she was an evangelical at the time. Uh, and I learned from her family and her pastors as well. When I would go visit her family, she would introduce me to her pastors and I had something of a relationship with them for a while, their, their worship service. There was a, again, like a, a, a sensitivity to um, the reality of God, grace and its effect on the life of a community there that, uh, and beginning with the family, but then going to their network of friends that I had only encountered there at that, at that point in my life. I hadn't seen that before. I remember crying in their uh, worship service, being moved by the homily and the music. Um, I remember being moved by her parents and their marriage. Um, and then, of course, I would debate with her. So I was a Catholic. She was an evangelical. Um, and I remember like this. Hopefully I've come I've come away since then, I hope. But like I remember debating some fine point about theology and I tried to cite second Romans uh, to her. and of course such a book doesn't exist and uh, she promptly you know let me know that with all the grace that she had um, but anyway all this to say that she was a, a gift uh, in so many ways in in my growth as a as you know a young man and uh, growth in faith and uh, I think the, the last thing to say about that is just that when I all of a sudden thought like oh no maybe I'm supposed to be a monk um, and I, you know, I, I, I told her about this, um, you know, I, I guess I won't go into all the details, but at the end of the day, it was, it was so clear to her and to me, uh, that the most important thing that we both need to do in life is follow God's will. Yeah. And we don't want any kind of relationship apart from the will of God, as much as we you know, might like each other, uh, maybe even love each other. It's like, no, apart from God, none of this makes sense. So um, both of us being really secure in that um, made the, at least from my experience, you know, the, the, the parting uh, so much easier and, and, um, and peaceful. Not that it wasn't hard and I didn't cry my eyeballs out for the next year and a half or so, mm -hmm. but it was, it was, I was able to do it, I think, because of the freedom that she gave me and the, the, the stamp that she gave me. It's like, yeah, what God wants for us is what is most important. So uh, how did I come to this um, thought that maybe I'm supposed to be a monk? Well, again, I, I knew some guys at UD who joined the monastery before I did, and I was friends with them. I had played intramural flag football with Father Thomas, and uh, Father Ambrose was my RA at, at the University of Dallas. Uh, so I was impressed when these young guys who seemed very capable and uh, happy, they did something like join a monastery. Wow. Yeah. And uh, that made me think, well, maybe I'm supposed to do that. Why not anyway? So I went to that retreat, um, again, not knowing it was vocations retreat, but on the retreat thinking, okay, maybe I should consider this. And I developed also a relationship with the abbot at that time, Father Dennis Farkas Falvey. And uh, he was a very, very important father figure in my life, able to understand me and affirm me and correct me in ways that, that were really, really healthy for me. Um, and through 
conversations with him that didn't begin as vocation stuff, but just began mm-hmm. as, as friends. I remember asking him, you know, Father Dennis, he was, I don't know, early 70s at the time I met him. I said, Father Dennis, like, would you be my spiritual director? And he said, yeah. how about we just be free? And so mm-hmm. uh, we, we met fairly regularly, but the relationship was um, not formal in a spiritual direction sense, but obviously he did like help me discern stuff. Wow. But it was um, it was a mutual relationship, it was a genuine friendship where I could see that um, I was important to him, just like he was important to me. And um, through that relationship and coming to to know myself more deeply and seeing in myself a very deep desire for a life of prayer, a life of learning and a fraternity. And then seeing that here concretely among this group of dudes, like that's what they were doing. I remember, for example, being really struck by watching the monks one day at Vespers bowing for the glory be and like bowing with them spontaneously. And then like thinking to myself, like, what else should I do with my body than this? Like, what makes more sense than bowing um, at the doxology? Uh, and then I remember really being charmed by the fraternity of the monks. There were so many young guys at that time. Um, and so, yeah, long story short, uh, after a year or two of discerning after college and drawing closer and closer to the community, I reached a point where I thought, maybe I'm supposed to be here, maybe I'm not. But the mm-hmm. one thing I know for sure is I'm never going to answer that question unless I try it. And so I knew that the next step was to discern from within the novitiate. And so I joined the novitiate and there was still plenty to cry about and, and surrender. And, um, you know, uh, another part of the story, but I'll, I'll bring it to a close, but just at least to name it. Another part of the story is definitely learning to make a sacrifice, learning mm. to, you know, hold your freedom and give God what he's asking, not because he's ripping out of your hands, but because you have discovered the love and the desire to obey that allows you freely to give him what he's asking uh, and, and not to just be bitter or to cling to it in your heart and therefore make yourself miserable. Yeah. So in my novitiate, I, I, I learned, I think also that, that spirit of sacrifice and sometime around my uh, first Christmas in the monastery, I remember, I remember being able to make that sacrifice, giving up the things I'd wanted in the past and particularly the relationship with that wonderful girl. And, um, accepting uh, from God all that he was offering uh, to me in that in the monastery. Mm-hmm. And there's a sense in which I've never looked back. I honestly feel like I've been shot out of a rocket since that Christmas. And I'm sure there will be ups and downs in life. Um, you know, there have been more or less difficult things, but in a fundamental sense, it has just been awesome uh, ever oh. since uh, that Christmas. Oh, praise God. Yeah, that, that is an incredible story. And, uh, it's, you know, it sounds like you were looking for God, but God was also looking for you. Oh, yeah. Uh, and um, one thing I want to kind of follow up on, because I know this is a topic that's kind of important to you, and that's kind of this relationship between faith and reason. Um, there is a sense in which, it, you know, and I think this sound, sounds like this is what happened in your life, but Essentially, it's, you know, St. Paul says, like, uh, uh, faith is is the substance of things not seen, or, like, faith is almost like an intuition. Like, we just, all of a sudden, we just see it. Like, we just see God's presence. God is real. Like, and maybe reason at first doesn't have so much to do with it, but then we have to, like, figure out the relationship between faith and reason. Because I just, like, have this, like, certainty but now I need to like back it up because people are challenging me on it. Like, how come you can see things that, how come you can just like feel God's present and like, I can't like, and you know, I have my reasons for saying God's not real, but you all, you seem to think that he is real. So prove it, you know? Um, And it's especially difficult in our society where the mentality is if you can't measure it with some sort of scientific instrument, it's not real. Um, so, but you've done a lot of thinking about this. You've done a lot of philosophical study. Like, can you just break down for us a little bit the the relationship between faith and reason and how that's worked out in your own life? Yeah, a lot of good, uh, threads of, of conversation we could pull out of, uh, the way you introduced it there. Um, 
I guess I would say to, to pick up on what you said about, uh, you know, sort of believing first and then trying to figure out the reason for the belief subsequently. Um, there's another text that I like to contemplate. You know, St. Peter says that we're sh we should give a reason for our hope. Mm -hmm. And that means that your ability to express the rational intelligibility or defense of the faith takes place within that life of hope, a life of faith, hope, and love. And so to be able to justify Christianity apart from that faith, hope, and love is, I think, a very dubious project. And um, you, it's only within the life of faith that the real intelligibility of faith is going to be made manifest. Um, so that's one thing uh, from what you said that I, I just want to throw out there, because historically, I think that's a really important point. And we see that in modernity, where you know, there were a lot of apologetic efforts that try to step outside the Christian tradition and justify it on the basis of a kind of religious philosophy or philosophy of religion. And those ended up always being reductive. Um, and, you know, I think Karl Barth in the 20th century was, you know, one of the famous people who kind of said, hey, this isn't working out. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's one point that I think is good to make. Uh, another point that I like to make is, if you look at Fetus et Ratio, St. John Paul II's encyclical, he begins with, you know, this call from Delphi to like, know yourself. If you want to begin to harmonize faith and reason, like the two wings of a dove that, uh, you know, raise the human spirit to the contemplation of God, you have to begin with this introspective uh, um, movement where you yeah. try to know yourself. And I think that one of the easiest way to show why this is so important is if you consider some of the contemporary scientific atheists like a Richard Dawkins, mm -hmm. where they are so convinced of their science, their reason, and they trace out what they think are its logical implications to the point where they assert that they are just machines, just wet machines. And they are just carrying out the ineluctably determined consequences of their neurology and biology and billiard ball atoms in motion. I don't see how, I mean, maybe one of them can one day enlighten me, but like, I don't see how you can say that without a profound ignorance of your own self, mm. because you've reached this point where you have now declared null the life of freedom and rationality that you claim to have employed in order to articulate your scientific worldview. Because if like you, Dr. Dawkins, or whatever scientific atheists are just a machine spouting out your evolutionary theory or your reductivism or materialism or whatever, with the same necessity that Siri tells me where the next, you know, coffee shop is, That's and right. she can do no other than that, given the input that I have supplied, like, why should I believe him? Yeah. You know, these reductive materialist visions only get off the ground with a complete ignorance of the one speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of philosophers refer to this as like a failure uh, of retorsion, where the thesis that you're articulating undermines your capacity to articulate the thesis. Yeah. Like if I say to you, like, I am, uh, I am incapable of speaking a complete sentence. Like, like if I say that to you, it's like, well, shoot, he just did it when he was declaring his inability to do it. And so it's, it's the same thing of the scientific atheists. It's like, I am not free. I am not rational because I am a machine and I can prove that using my free inquiry and rational thought. It's like, where are we now? We are so far from knowing ourselves. So I think St. John Paul II in Fetus et Ratio is, is appealing to everybody. It's like, okay, if we want to see how faith and reason are harmonious, we need to reach a certain introspection and spiritual depth that allows us to ask these questions correctly and not get lost logic chopping on our concepts to the point that they lead to these absurdities that I'm a machine. Yeah, no, I agree. I want to continue on with this because um, <clears throat> we're seeing just such a, an increase of um, what we call nuns, right? in the, in the world, right. Especially, um, you know, uh, the younger generation, 
coming out of school or, you know, discerning marriage, you know, in their late twenties and things like that. And they're struggling to find reason or purpose to do these things because, you know, the temptations of the world or the, the narrative of the world is so contrary to, um, what the church is teaching or what the truth is teaching. And so I'm, I'm curious, <clears throat> what you would say are some of the fundamental um, uh, grounding. So maybe another way of saying it is we've talked a lot about this search for God. Well, how do we work to inspire those that don't even have that search, right? They're not aware of it, um, but they're not even looking for it because of these sort of scientific worldviews that have um, created a, a religion of their own uh, and created this sort of, you know, um, uh, atheism, but, but again, not even an intelligible one, um, you know, within, within the, the secular sphere. So where would you start, um, with, with that? How would you work or how are you working to inspire that within others? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that one of the most important things to do is to help people search for God. Uh, and mm -hmm. that's what I understand to be your question. And yeah. the obstacles to that are going to be different for the different people. Um, you know, some people, I think, have a hard time searching for God because they know that if they find him, like, that's not inconsequential. Like, I owe him everything. If I run up against God, it's like, holy smokes, I, I owe him my mind, my will, my whole life. So I think there is something, at least I know I experienced that in my life and still in some measure experienced that. If I am in any way weak in my apprehension of the reality of God, at least partially, that's because I interiorly don't want to give something up that I know I would have to do if I found him. <laughs> so I think that's one, one thing. And so we have to help soften people's mm -hmm. um, wills that are sometimes set against the discovery of God. So that's one thing. Another thing is um, to help them overcome the tremendous superficiality in which we are all swimming. So what do I mean by that? Yeah. Uh, one thing is that in my experience or my impression is that atheism is largely a first world problem. That is, mm -hmm. if you can be so indifferent to the question of God, like, is there a justice uh, uniting all things who will correct, redeem, straighten what is crooked, water what is dry. Like if, if is, is there or is there not someone to make sense of my life and what has happened? You know, people who could be indifferent to that are people who have had a lot of things going easily for them. Mm. And those who, you know, in another country where they have suffered uh, kidnapping, rape, murder, war, famine, corruption, and they are just crying out, God, if you're there, help me, because I don't see how to go on apart from you giving meaning to my life, if not now in the future that I hold out hope for. Like there's a there's a lot at stake at the question of God. And if you're like, you know, at this college party or at the cooler of everybody, you know, in the business making hundreds of thousands of dollars, like, do you believe in God? I don't know, man. You know, what do you want to watch the movie later? It's like... I, these people only, you know, sometimes when they encounter some suffering that really brings them to their knees, then they begin to recognize the stakes of the question. Mm. Uh, you know, then like, is there a unity beyond all reality? Uh, is my life meaningful? Uh, is there something eternal to the love that I like to think I experience with other people like that? Okay. Now such a soul who's sort of woken up from his superficiality and now asking profoundly human questions of, of absolute importance. Now, this is a person who can hopefully be helped to hope in the reality of God and to see the justification of that hope, the reason for our hope. Yeah. Um, one author that I think uh, could probably help a lot of people in this regard is somebody like Blaise Pascal. Mm -hmm. So he, he writes militantly against this kind of superficiality. And he says, like, there are, there are two kinds of people, this is a paraphrase, but two kinds of people that he thinks are on the right track. You know, the people who know the misery of human life or know all the weakness and fragility of human life and therefore are intensely asking the question of God. And then those, on the other hand, who know the reality of God and are doing everything they can to follow him. Those are the only two kinds of people that 
that I think Pascal says are, are, are on the right track. The people who are unaware of the, the frailty of human existence and therefore can just cast themselves into endless distraction, these people are, are, are in a very sad way. And, uh, and one of the biggest gifts that we can sometimes receive is, is, a, is a good butt kicking in our lives that, that wakes us up to the reality of life so we can finally start living it. Yeah, Father. Well, thank you. I mean, to the amount of threads that you just uh, put forth, I, I mean, that that our listeners and ourselves can can contemplate on, right? I, I love that connection to the depth of first world, um, you know, affluence or consumerism and it, its effect on, on this um, uh, uh, lack of, of pursuing God or, you know, just even this awareness that that's something worth pursuing because you're right. When we can binge watch Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu and and a thousand other now uh, streaming services, right, um, are grabbing our attentions, right, in, 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 in these um, lesser developed countries, uh, they don't have those luxuries. Yeah. And, and in many cases, like you're talking about that depth of suffering that they experience. Wow. Well, um, I, yeah, thank you. I think that's, that's, great points uh, for us to be, to really discern and take deeper. It's one yes. reason I love the outdoors, by the way, is because there's so much in our life that inclines us to become like the Borg in Star Trek. Yeah. Um, I'm not a big Star Trek guy. I haven't watched much, but I've watched a few episodes because some of the monks like them. Shout out to Father Augustine uh, and Father <laughs> Stephen. But they, um, so I've seen some of the episodes and there's this great figure in them, uh, the Borg. I'm sure you guys yeah. probably know better than I do, where yeah. the, you are you are depersoned by plugging into this complex machine. And it just seems to me that with our phones and other apparatuses of connectivity into this economic engine of advertising and consumption, that we are just plugging into a Borg that is transforming us from genuine persons to uh, just the collection of abstract qualities that we can pick from a drop-down menu to describe our profile. And I'm losing my genuine personhood and I'm being recast now as some kind of profile that can be targeted by the economic engine. And it's, it's awful, the effect that that has. And you know, it doesn't take you know, a crotchety monk in his hole to like tell people that this is a problem, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. but in so many ways we're measuring it. It's, it's, uh, it's effect on our social well-being, our friendships, our intellectual life, and yes, also our spiritual life. Um, so I, I love unplugging, um, and being outside in the woods on the mountains, all those places where you just have to deal with reality and, uh, not the Borg. Amen. It's so true. Yeah, I I see everything you're talking about. We're losing our our humanity and our personhood in a sense with this uh, technological paradigm. It's really driven by economics, money. You know, uh, at the end of the day. Um, but one thing I want to kind of follow up on is so we see these in our culture. There's these kind of these two impulses. There's one towards um, materialism, you know, atheism, like um just like you mentioned like atoms banging around billiard balls but there's also i see like in our culture a, a a spiritual hunger kind of awakening um people are searching for something beyond you know maybe not in mass numbers but i would say in 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 ever increasing numbers people are waking up and saying is this for all there is 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 it is life real is meaning just an illusion or is there more um to the world than this and then so you see a lot of people turning to um, different spiritualities and kind of approaching spirituality as kind of like a buffet. Like, well, I'll take a little bit from this religion and I'll take a little bit from that religion and I'll take this practice because it makes me feel good. And like, I'll take this other practice because I find it brings me peace mentally or whatever. And it's kind of the smorgasbord approach to religion. And I think as Christians, we can kind of assume, well, if somebody wakes up to a need for meaning or a need for to know God, they're immediately just going to become Christian. But that's not always true. Like a lot of times people can wake up and say, uh, I want to find God, but I'm going to do it in this kind of smorgasbord approach. So like, how do we, how do we as Christians, like what's, uh, 
engage this kind of hunger for spirituality, but also point to kind of the necessity of knowing God in the unique revelation that is Jesus Christ and his church. Because I think that's kind of another leap for people is not only does God exist, but if he does, why do I need to do it in kind of this formal religious structure? Why can't I just kind of pick and choose a little bit of everything? That's an awesome question. And uh, a lot of thoughts came to my mind. So if I, if in what I say now, I lose sight of the, of the ultimate end of your question, which I understand to be like, why Jesus and the church uh, redirect me. But I want to begin um, back uh, where you observed, I think correctly, that there is a dramatic spiritual hunger out there. And a lot of these people who say, I'm spiritual, not religious, uh, you know, you can criticize them one way or another, but a lot of them are quite sincere, quite, quite sincerely spiritual. And I think that um, this is an inevitable consequence of the collapse of the lie that, you know, we're just economic fodder and you can be happy if you just watch, you know, whatever we put on the TV or that pleasures are really going to satisfy you. At the end of the day, people know that's baloney. And uh, the restless heart still longs for God, even if it can't name him yet. It knows it's not satisfied with the goods of this world, but it longs for infinity. It longs for the fullness of truth, goodness, beauty, and so forth. And so the fact that we're still hungry uh, when the goods of the world fail to satisfy, no surprise there. And so no surprise if there are millions, billions of people who deep down are expressing that restless heart still. I think that's great. Uh, another point I want to make in this regard is that um, I, if you look at like a phenomenon like Jordan Peterson, for example, mm -hmm. uh, there, I, I, I don't watch a lot of his stuff, but I have watched some of it. And, you know, you can criticize different things, but obviously there's uh, he is tapping into a spiritual hunger that so many people have and he's doing it well. And it's I have something, I guess, of like envy as a preacher. It's like, how does this psychologist, uh, ostensibly secular, get the hearts of tens of thousands, not you know, hundreds or millions of, of people to listen to him with that kind of fidelity, where he is really helping them discover a meaning that at least seems to be driving their existence? Or if you think also about his book, I think it's 12 Rules for Life. Yeah, it's like the Catholic Church gets beaten with a stick for talking about rules. And here comes a guy to give you 12 rules for your life and everybody's buying it. <laughs> like, how come he can talk about rules and everybody goes for it <laughs> and we talk about rules and everybody runs away? It's funny. So uh, there's a little bit of preacher envy, I feel like. I, it, sometimes I just want to grab the mic and say, give me a chance, you know, <laughs> but he does it so well that for some reason he's he's able to reach a, a people. But I would say definitely that um, he's, he doesn't have, so far as I can see, the gospel, mm -hmm. at least if I follow correctly his readings of scripture. There's, there's a lot of archetypes and there's a lot of wisdom in that. But there is something so central to the coherence of the faith, hope, and love that I think we all long for in our restless hearts. There's something so central to history in that. Like you can talk about archetypes and eternal truths that sort of hover over the vagaries and particulars of history as kind of like the, you know, the endless cycles of, of an eternal nature. Um, but that, that worldview doesn't correspond to the depth of our hope, where what I'm longing for is not just some form that I and every other human being can, you know, step into in order to have a successful human qua human life. Mm. What we really want at the end of the day is not just a successful human life, but I want to matter for the person that I am. You know, I, Father John, what is the meaning that I have that no one else has in this world because of the unique creature that I am in my person? And I think that there's lots of wisdom in, in many different religious traditions of the East and the West and philosophers that can help you understand basically like the Jordan Peterson archetypal wisdom. And there's so much good in that. But I do think that at the end of the day, the people want to know that they matter as individuals mm. and not just as successful members of a species. And I don't see anybody talking about that except Judaism and Christianity. And then I don't see anybody except Jesus Christ who offers a vision for the whole of history in which every one of us plays a part. 
I, I, I just don't see it anywhere. And so if when people come to understand that, you know, that is part of what Jesus means, that he's the alpha and the omega, tying all of human history into a single story of God's love for his people and through his people, every human being on the planet, inviting everyone by name to a participation in his own life as the unique person he's created them to be. And you can think of the image of the body of Christ, of, you know, the fingers, the toes, the eyes and the nose and everything. Uh, this Christian anthropology, which recognizes our unity as a people under God in the truth, and yet finds a place also for our diversity as people God calls by name for a particular destiny. I don't see anybody even talking about that, never mind having the historical facts to back it up. You know, the reason I as a Christian have that hope is because 2000 years ago, a marvelous man lived, died, and rose again. And there are good reasons to think he actually did. And that the people he commissioned, who also went to their deaths, dying for that proclamation, are credible. Yeah. I, I don't see how, how else people can get to the, to, the, to the measure that we hope for, apart from Jesus. And, uh, and thanks be to God, like it is so credible that he is who he says he is. And thus, I am who he says I am. You know, that I, in my unique personhood, really do matter to God as a finger in the body or a branch on the vine. Yeah. So in, in, in short form, I, would, I, would, I guess I'd say that. Yeah, uh, that's beautiful. I love that. No, I do too. And, and Father Beyer, I just, um, it hurts me to come to the end of our conversation here, you know, because <laughs> as I know, we need to, to wrap it up because Sam and I could, could, carry on with you for another couple hours. I'm uh, without a doubt. So I just want to start by saying thank you so very much for your wisdom and for your, um, for your passion, right. That's, that's, that's come out in these, um, this brief, you know, conversation on, on our faith and on rational thinking and right order in the world. And so I'm really grateful for that, but I want to make sure that you have a little bit of time to let us know where can men learn more about you, your order, where would you like to direct them? We'll put it in the show notes. Um, and, uh, just love to, to have that from you. Yeah. So, uh, the Cistercian order is, a, um, you know, a big reality across the globe. The monasteries are each unique among themselves. My monastery is a monastery that has a school. And so we all become teachers. We also all become priests. And you can learn more about our way of life at www.cistercian.org, C-I-S-T-E-R-C-I-A-N. Uh, I'm also the vocations director. So my contact information is listed on that website. And so people can feel free to reach out to me if they're interested in learning more about our way of life. Uh, as for reading, I would say that if people are interested in the Cistercian order, they should go get a copy of the Rule of St. Benedict. It is a beautiful, uh, short work of spirituality, and there are lots of people, not just monks, who draw a lot of nourishment from it. So I think anybody who, who's open and interested in monasticism would profit greatly from reading that book, but especially somebody who's, who's curious to see if uh, God might be calling him or her to the monastic life. And then after that, I would say, find uh, some sermons by St. Bernard. Uh, there are uh, lots of short little collections of his sermons. He is a, a very golden tongued, uh, beautiful homilist that, um, you know, so may, if, I think initially it might take a little bit to get into the monastic literature, um, you know, the way in which uh, the methods and the figures and everything that's used. But once you're in that world, it's um, it's a beautiful world to swim in. So that would be my recommendation. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so very much for your time, for your vocation, um, for your priesthood and, uh, and your time with us. It's been, it's been a big blessing. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I, I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. Awesome. So as we like to end every one of our episodes, be a man, be a saint. <laughs>